Welcome back to the Constitutional Clarion. I'm going to finish this string of videos on the coronation by dealing on this occasion with coronation regalia. So I'm going to look at the crown of St Edward, which is the crown which, with which the monarch is crowned in the coronation ceremony, and the imperial state crown, which is the crown that's used when the monarch leaves the abbey and is also the crown used commonly in Parliament and elsewhere. And in the other video, I will deal with regalia. Before we get into detail about crowns, there is one question, and that is, why should we care? Let's face it, crowns are very remote from our own lives, and frankly, haven't we really got over fairy tales yet? Well, let me give you three reasons why I think crowns are interesting. The first reason is that they are actually exquisite works of craftsmanship. They use very rare materials and they are very beautiful to see in real life. When I was a child, uh, my family went to the United Kingdom and we visited the Tower of London, as many people do. And I really wanted to see the crown jewels. Uh, but my father was uh, a man who was quite impatient of queues and there was a massive queue to see the crown jewels and I missed out. I went back later with my husband and again, Massive queue, didn't get to see them. Third time I went, I went with my son, thinking to myself, mm, there'll be a massive queue and I'll miss out again. But on this occasion, on a very bleak winter morning, we went and there was absolutely no one there. So we went in and we got on the little travelator that goes past the crown jewels and we were both amazed by them. And once we got to the end and we realised there was still no one else there, we went all the way around, back to the beginning, and went through again. And actually, we did that four times. And uh, it was because they simply were so magnificent to see in real life that even with a young boy who was, on the whole, pretty impatient about such things normally, even he could see how amazing and impressive these jewels were. So answer number one, why do we care? Actually, like a magnificent painting or any other great work of craftsmanship, crowns are quite beautiful. Second reason is that they are actually emblematic of my work. So I work uh, in the field of constitutional law and particularly in relation to the crown. So I've written books like The Chameleon Crown, uh, which is a book that deals with the decolonisation of Australia and that relationship between the monarch in the United Kingdom and Australia and how that's changed over time. And I also write books about limits on executive power and particularly the limits on the powers of monarchs and governors general. So, um, and you'll see this picture come up later. Um, uh, so I wrote a, a, a book called The Veiled Scepter, which uh, takes the analogy of the scepter as um, a threat um, or a limit on power. And so because the crown uh, represents the sort of work that I've been doing for a long time, it's probably a bit more intriguing to me than to other people. But the third reason, and this might be the reason you want to watch this video, is because the history of it is fascinating. And of course, coronations being events that are very notable, have been written about and recorded for quite a long period of time, well, indeed, well over a thousand years. And so we have this remarkable timeline of history where we can see that changing role of the monarch and of the executive power that the monarch used to be able to exercise and gradually move to a power exercised by ministers. And we can see that represented in the history of these crown jewels. So for all of those reasons, I think crowns are very interesting indeed. So let's talk about them. Crowns, historically, uh, have been symbols of sovereignty and leadership and go back a very long way. So for example, the British Museum has a crown, a bronze crown that was found on the skull of a man who was dug up in Kent, which they dated back to around 200 BC. Crowns became more important in the medieval e era where the monarchy was contested, where there were battles, where there were arguments about who uh, had the right to inherit the crown, and therefore crowns and coronations were really important. 
Um, unfortunately, we don't have any more of those medieval crowns. They were all destroyed at the time that Oliver Cromwell came in as the Lord Protector of a Republic, the Commonwealth, and he melted down the gold and used it for money, and he sold off most of the gems, although a few got hidden away in people's pockets and slipped out of the country and came back later. Now we do have some images in paintings of the earlier crowns that were destroyed. So here is a painting of Richard II wearing all his coronation gear. The problem is that we don't really know whether any of these are particularly accurate. In relation to that portrait, for example, we know that the depiction of the coronation chair is not accurate. Uh, and of course, Richard II was actually crowned when he was 10 years old. So probably not the most accurate of portraits. But some crowns from that era did escape the country because they were crowns that belonged to women, princesses, who then left the country to marry. And so they were out of the country by the time that Oliver Cromwell started melting down regalia. So, for example, we have um, the still existing crown of Princess Blanche, who was the daughter of Henry IV and who left the country to get married to King Ludwig III of Bavaria in 1402. And this shows how extraordinarily intricate and decorated crowns were in that period. Indeed, this crown probably belonged to the wife of Richard II beforehand. That was Anne of Bohemia. We also have in existence the crown of Scotland, which was made for James V of Scotland and was first worn in 1540. And that survives today because, of course, Scotland was out of the realm of Oliver Cromwell and uh, it can be seen today in Edinburgh Castle. So these sorts of crowns give us a bit of an idea of what the medieval regalia might have been like. Now, after the destruction of that regalia and then the restoration of the monarchy with Charles II, he wanted to recreate that regalia and ordered that it be done at great expense. Now, the key crown to recreate was the crown of Edward the Confessor, known as St Edward's crown, and it was supposed to be similar to the previous one, but the person making it had suggested that it be a simple gold crown. Charles II was not impressed by this idea, he did not think it would be splendid enough, and he insisted that it be set with various diamonds and other forms of gemstones that were very expensive. The problem, however, was that the budget didn't really extend to allow this, so the compromise was that the crown would be made in such a way that the settings for the gemstones would be ones that could be opened and closed, so that you could then hire all the gems that you needed, and he spent a fair deal of money hiring them, 500 pounds in those days, a lot of money. You could hire the gemstones, use them for your coronation, and then a few days later they were all pulled out again. And then next time there was a coronation, you hired some more. And indeed that went on till around 1911, when the crown of St Edward was finally permanently set with gems. Now the thing about the crown of St Edward was that it was only used within Westminster Abbey and for the coronation. This goes back to history because the original crown of St Edward was regarded as a holy relic because Edward himself was regarded as a saint and therefore the king was not allowed to take the crown outside the abbey because of its religious significance. And the consequence of that was if you needed to be a king parading around showing people your crown or wearing it to parliament, you needed a second crown. And that's why there was a second state crown, which was a working crown. And that was the one that was to be used more commonly. So that one did need to be permanently set with gems. And uh, it was indeed set with a number of very expensive gems. Uh, so it originally had 900 diamonds, 549 pearls, 20 emeralds, 18 sapphires and 10 rubies. So it was a very expensive crown. But because it was a crown that was used commonly, uh, it needed to be renovated often and indeed replaced. Whereas the crown of St Edward became a permanent crown because it was only used at the time of coronation, so used very rarely indeed. Even then, the crown of St Edward was not used all the time and in fact became rather um, unfashionable. 
um, both because of its form, the way it looked, it just wasn't seen as, as impressive as one that was covered with diamonds, uh, but also because of its weight. It was very heavy. It was about, uh, it was over two kilos in weight. So if you think of balancing two kilos of weight on your head, you know what it's like for King Charles the other day and some of these other monarchs. So sometimes, particularly in the 18th century, the king would not be crowned with that particular crown. They would instead carry it in on, on a cushion and then a different crown would be used for the crowning. And that was certainly the case for Queen Victoria because she was very young, slim uh, woman, just 18 years old. Uh, so she had um, a much lighter crown using the imperial state crown. And um, also Edward VII who followed her and that was because he'd become very ill with appendicitis just before the date of the first date that was supposed to be for his coronation. The coronation had to be deferred but even then he was still quite weak and recovering so it was considered not a good idea for him to wear the crown of St Edward during his coronation. The consequence was he also used the imperial state crown but ever since him every monarch has been crowned with the crown of St Edward, the rather gold heavy one. And as I said, from 1911, it was permanently set with jewels. The crown of St Edward is made of 22 karat gold. It contains six sapphires, 12 rubies, 345 aquamarines. And like most British crowns, it has arches, which are surmounted by what's called a mond, that's the round uh, sphere there, which represents the world. And over that, there is a cross, which symbolizes that the sovereign is subject to God. The state crown, the working one, did need to be repaired and renewed often. And in fact, uh, about every hundred years, it's completely replaced. So it was replaced in the 1700s. It was replaced again for Queen Victoria, and it was again replaced in 1937. But of course, they took off the various jewels, etc. So there is still a lot of history in the existing imperial state crown, even though the structure and frame of the crown goes only back as far as 1937. One of the most historic gems on this crown is the Black Prince's Ruby. It dates back to around 1367, so it's much older than the crown itself. Now, it was said to have been given to the Black Prince, who, by the way, was the son of Edward III, by the King of Castile, who himself took it from another king, the King of Grenada. So all of these um, gems did tend to have a rather murky past. Now, this ruby is quite interesting because it's of an irregular shape. And it was also allegedly used by Henry V in his helmet at Agincourt in 1415 and also by Richard III in the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, in which he was killed. Now, beneath that ruby, you'll see the diamond there is the Cullinan II diamond, and we'll come back to the Cullinan diamonds later. Now, another historic gem, which also has a chequered provenance, is the Stuart Sapphire. Now, it had been apparently smuggled out of the country during Cromwell's Commonwealth and then returned with Charles II and was then placed on the crown. But it was again smuggled out of the country, this time by James II when he was deposed and taken with him to France, where it remained in the Stuart clan until 1807, whereupon the last of the Stuarts died. Now, this sapphire was then retrieved by agents of George III and brought back to the royal family's treasury. George III, George IV, I should say, gave it to his daughter, Charlotte, but when he died, he passed on the gem to his mistress, Lady, Lady Conningham. Now, after George IV died, the sapphire was retrieved from Lady Conningham and was mounted in the imperial state crown and it sat below the Black Prince's ruby and it was there for Queen Victoria's coronation. It was later replaced by the Cullinan II diamond and so now the Stuart sapphire is actually on the back of the crown in the equivalent position. On the cross at the top of the crown is St Edward's sapphire which is thought to have come from the coronation ring of Edward the Confessor that was later discovered in his tomb when his body was moved in 1163. 
which adds a um, new meaning to that idea of being a tomb raider. The frame of this crown was replaced again in 1937, at which time it was called the Imperial State Crown. And the mond and the cross on that crown come directly from Queen Victoria's earlier crown. Below the mond, if you can see it, hang four rather large pearls, and they apparently were pearl earrings that belonged to Queen Elizabeth I, although it's not absolutely certain that she wore them. And because of all the jewels in it, the Stuart Sapphire, the Cullinan Diamond, the Black Prince's Ruby, the pearls of Queen Elizabeth I, this makes the Imperial State Crown actually far more interesting in many ways than St Edward's Crown. So in conclusion, what have we learnt about these crowns? For me, the exercise of doing this research prior to the coronation changed my perspective of them. Up until then, I had thought of crowns as quite static objects. It was an object which was defined by its parts and didn't change. So what I learned about crowns is that they change all the time. There are bits that are taken off them. You can detach arches. You have um, jewels that get taken off and put on and move around. And you've got this really interesting relationship with history where you can have a crown from made in 1937, but which contains jewels from, you know, the Black Prince back in the 1300s, the Stuart Sapphire, um, the Cullinan Diamond. You've got this extraordinary breadth of history that is represented by the various jewels in the one object. So these are not static objects. They are objects that change over time, although they are still objects that um, express the same meaning, so the same sort of ideas of sovereignty, uh, but also ideas about how that sovereignty ought to be exercised in terms of you know, nobility, not, not abusing power, um, exercising it with justice and mercy and all those sorts of attributes. Uh, and we'll look at that a bit more when I do my other video in relation to regalia. So thank you for watching the Constitutional Clarion again. I hope you join me next time. Goodbye.